Our gut reactions are the sum of all of our experiences and everything we've learned comes out often in an immediate emotional response. Just, that's wrong, that's right, whatever that is. That's the sum of all of your knowledge and understanding. And that's what we should rely on. Think about insurance, what is it? It's a promise to pay. You hand over hard cash in case something goes wrong. And we promise to look after you if something happens. We hope something doesn't, but you need us. My kids ask me that, and I say I talk to a lot of people. That's my job, talking to people. Because I don't, it's hard to explain when you're a COO what you actually do. You're the guy the behind the scenes that make the business work. You're kind of the conductor of all the different areas, but not in charge. Everyone else is in charge of their different parts of the business, but you're trying to make it all work. And it's really hard to do. You have to do it vicariously. You have to do it through others. And as the article that, that I've written says, you have to do it with the right values for people to trust you. You have to do it with transparency. You have to be completely honest and open so that all those different people who were relying on you for their business to work will, will work with you. Otherwise, you could be in trouble. There is no typical day. If you look at my diary, there could be 10, 15 meetings in one day. And it's all sorts of things. I'm in charge of all change, all operations. Uh, in charge of our future technology division. Um, I run one of the subsidiaries. I'm the chairman and CEO of the Hiscox Underwriting Limited. I am responsible for information security, I'm responsible for data quality, I'm responsible for our external suppliers, I'm responsible for all change and all projects in our business. So look at my diary and you'll just see every day is, is different. I work for Hiscox because of what we try to be. So we try to be a trusted insurer, which is a bit of an oxymoron, but we try every day uh, to operate in a way that our customers can trust us. Think about insurance, what is it? It's a promise to pay. You hand over hard cash in case something goes wrong, and we promise to look after you if something happens. We hope something doesn't, but you need us. And it's at that point when you can break that promise, and a lot of times insurers do. We try really hard. If we think someone should be covered, then we pay out. So it's not about the wordings. It's about the intent, the spirit of the promise that we've made to you, that we try to honor that every day. I think that varies as you go through your career. So when you start your career, you just want to prove yourself. You just want to see if you can. Whatever it is you said you're going to do, you have to learn how to do it, you have to do what you're told, and you have to get on with it. Then you start to get good, and you start to realize you can deliver. And then you start to deliver more things, and then you're motivated by making a difference. And then at some point that switches to, I can only do a certain amount of stuff. I need to get other people to join me and come with me, and then I can do more. And that's when you transition more to wanted to be a leader because you can achieve more you can do things more in the right way through others and that's when your interest changes to motivating others and creating an environment that everyone loves working in and where you can really achieve the right things hmm. successful leaders is a how to be a successful leader is an age-old question and I think everyone has a different approach to it there are obviously some key principles. Uh, the first one, you've got, to be, you've got to be the kind of person people want to follow. And that can be many different things. But I think of it in the sort of First World War analogy. If I jump out of the, the trenches and say, follow me, are people going to do that? It's as basic as that. And sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes it's no. And you've got to try everything you can so when you need them, they're right behind you. Uh, the key to that, actually, is to be yourself. 
is you've got to that point where you've achieved lots of things. You're obviously smart, you obviously can achieve things, you can deliver, you know what you're doing. You've learned the industry, you've learned your profession. And being a leader then is about being yourself because people will follow you if you're authentic. They won't follow you if you're full of bullshit. They won't, they won't follow you. If they, if, they, if they spot anything that's not quite right, if they know that you're not saying what you really believe, they won't. So that's really important. You've got to be authentic. You've got to, be, you've got to care for the people that work for you. So many people get into leadership positions and don't care. They've done it for status, they've done it for money, power, all the wrong reasons. Good leaders care about who they work with and they care about creating an environment that people want to work in. If you get people motivated, get people to achieve, and get people to enjoy it, then you're onto a winner. And it's about trying to do that every day. I try and be a better leader every day. Well, I heard a saying, which I quite liked, and I used in a speech last week, which was, success needs three things. Dream big dreams, have fun, and just get shit done. If you follow those three things, you're doing really well. What I've done is chosen Hiscox. So I didn't actually choose the industry. A lot of people fall into insurance, but I like what we do. I like the way we try and work in the right way every day. I like the values we have. I like the integrity and authenticity of Hiscox. So that's what I've chosen really, because what I do actually is the same kind of job in every industry. You start to realize I've done 12 different jobs uh, in pretty much 12 different industries. Uh, and you notice that the key leadership in, as a COO is the same kind of role. So it's about the quality of the business you're in. So it's not really choosing insurance, it's choosing his goals. I haven't reached that yet. I've got this uh, saying that I use in terms of how, what, how successful people, they're all paranoid overachievers. So we never quite believe we're good enough. We work really hard, we get something done. And then when we've done it, right, done that, I'll move on, what's next? So you, you, that's a common theme with a lot of people who run businesses. You can't stop. You just want to move on to the next thing and you just discount what you've done. So I've not achieved what I want to achieve yet. I never thought I'd be made redundant. I thought I was too good for that. But the reality is that forces are often outside of your control. So I found myself in JP Morgan uh, at a time. So I was working as a uh, corporate finance advisor in merger and acquisitions, specializing in technology, at a time when the recession was in finance and IT. So I just got hit. I got hit in the sixth wave of redundancies. And even though you understand it, like I've just explained it, it hurts. It really hurts. It's a, it's a blow to your confidence. You suddenly think you're useless. Uh, if, no matter what anyone says, you've been rejected. They give you a nice bit of money, so there's not an issue about that. It's just a personal rejection. And that takes time to get over. I don't think like that. Uh, I like the phrase that says that each job is a preparation for the next one. So the reason I am who I am is because of what I've done in the past. It's like a building block. So if you think of it like that, nothing is a regret. It's just, uh, I'll try this. How does this work? What happens next? That's how, that's how we live our lives, I think. First thing I'd do is get really good at something. Really good. Focus on proving that you can make a difference and you count. Once you've done that, that'll tell you a bit more about yourself, a bit more about how business and the world works. After that, think very carefully about what you enjoy, about what you're doing and what you don't enjoy, and then start to move towards the bit you enjoy. Yeah. The, uh, one of the models I've seen about uh, your sort of ideal profession is a mixture of something that you're passionate about, something you're good at, you could be passionate about something you're rubbish at, so you're passionate about, good at, and you can get paid for. So look for those three things. 
And part of that is a, is a, is a self-discovery. Because when we're young, we just try to do jobs and try to do what we're told to do. We're still trying to learn who we are. Right? That's a lifetime to figure that out anyway. But you get a better idea as you get older. And that's the one thing I would tell my younger self going back is try to figure out who you are quicker. It took, took me 30 years to figure it out. And I'm happy doing what I do now, but that took a long time. If I had more of an idea of who I was, what I was passionate about, what I was good at, what I could get paid for, all three together, I think I would have got where I'm going, where I was going more quickly. That's my only regret is how long it's taken to be comfortable being who I am uh, and knowing what I think good leadership looks like and good business looks like. That would be the advice I would give. Disruption is a uh, is a key word at the moment with finance industry has been disrupted and it's it's insurance the banks insurance next uh, we're one of the sort of bigger players uh, one of those incumbents uh, yes it's a difficult question to answer of how you stop disruption how do you engage with startups who really want to eat your lunch uh, and we're working hard on that a lot of insurance companies that I see have responded by creating large funds and looking to invest in businesses and create accelerators and put them in a basement somewhere and control them. That's what incumbents do, you try to control the industry. I think the right approach is to be, what we're trying to do at Hiscox, is to be the first customer of choice. Because if you're a startup, you, you just want good customers. You don't want to be owned, you don't want to be controlled. You want someone you can work with, who you can sell your products to and develop your products with. So that's something we're trying to do, is be the customer of choice for insurance startups and entrepreneurs. It's having that second conversation. Lots of people come through the door here, they come to us, they've got an idea, uh, a great idea, a bit of technology or product, we have a nice conversation and a coffee and we get excited by that idea. But then nothing happens. Because the reality of our kind of business is we plan what we're going to do 12 months in advance. So you can't react to someone coming in with a new idea. And it's threatening as well. So you've got no resources, no flexibility. It's very threatening. You might have a second coffee and a second conversation, but it's not going to go anywhere. So what we've started to do when I'm creating is a customer trials capability. So I can have that second conversation. If it's a good idea, okay, what customers are we going to try this with? What technology are we going to put in place? What product could we sell? How could we start to learn from this and iterate? and create and develop the idea to turn it into something that would be long-lasting. That's the approach I'm going to try and take. Insurance is ripe for disruption. It, it's, we are such a poor industry in many ways. We do add value, but if you think about it, as customers as we all are, uh, we're paying for something probably with no return, if you're an optimist, you assume nothing's going to happen. You're not quite sure how to value it, how it brings value. And if you need it, the first question is, am I covered? Not, I'll make a claim, but am I covered? So there's so many ways that people can attack us uh, and provide better service and better, uh, better reassurance for customers. So we need to embrace that. We absolutely have to embrace that. I think it's going to happen in four different ways. First one is, all these intelligent devices and more information coming up, it's going to mean that insurance is going to be more personal in the future. So instead of providing car insurance and house insurance and life insurance and pet insurance, how about if I insure you? So this is the way we work in this because we look for good people. If good people live life in the right way, manage their risks, look after their stuff. So, they, so people with good morals and good approaches to life are good risks. So how about I insure you? and you just pay me one monthly fee and anything you do is fine. Anything you buy, anything you own, any activity you do, you're covered. Because I've insured you. I've insured the way you are, I've insured your personality, I've insured the way you live and the way you work. I'm happy with that. I'll give you one fee and I can start to do that with the amount of information I can collect about you and your lifestyle, social media and all the things, all the information available. Even your phone is tracking where you are and what you do. That gives us the ability to start providing personal insurance. Segment of one, we call it. 
instead of a segment of 20 to 30 year olds, narrow it right down to the individual. That's where we're going to go. That's the first example. Second one is intelligent devices. So we will put more and more devices into our home and into our car that track what we do. That way you can start to control the, the liability, control the risk, and you understand what the risk is. That makes premiums more accurate. So we can start to have a, a more of a relationship with our customers. So how about if you have tracking in your car? And one of our guys has just been through this. So uh, someone who works here is uh, East European. And he came over to live here, he's got two kids now, and he, want, he bought a car and he needed to get it insured. He couldn't get insurance, because he's from Eastern Europe and no one really wanted to know. And he had to uh, go for a company that put a black box into his car. Now you think, okay, then, then, it, then it tracks how fast he goes, how, how much he brakes, and, and when he drives at night or day, starts to track that and they can manage the risk. Now it's interesting because it creates a new relationship that's never happened before. So they gave him effectively a game with some dials on it where if he changed his driving and what he did, he could bring his premiums down. And he started off with a £4,000 premium and he's got it down to about 600 just by working on, on okay, well, if I, if I go a bit slower here or if, I breaks, you know, if I'm a bit more careful in my driving, I can bring the premiums down. And it became a game for him. The only problem is he's now managed his driving at a much better risk. And he started analysing it a little bit more and he realised the person putting the premiums up was his wife and the way she was driving. So that's a different dynamic. But that's the other thing that's coming into insurance is intelligent devices. The third one is moving to a more service base. So stop selling insurance. We don't, none of us want to buy insurance. One of the weird dynamics about insurance is the more you buy, the the less good you feel about yourself. Think about buying all the insurance in the world. What you're saying is, something bad's gonna happen. And we're all optimists. So you don't really feel good about buying insurance. There's, there's something wrong with that relationship. Uh, and also when you buy insurance, and someone says it's gonna cost you 600 pounds to insure your car, that's a judgment. You're judging someone, you're judging their risk. How, how, how dare we as insurance companies judge how you're gonna drive and what we think your risk is? So there's lots of problems with selling insurance. So how about we move to selling a service? So how about a, a house service where anything that goes wrong with your house, anything, you just call us. We'll sort it out. Now there may be insurance cover behind it, but from a customer experience point of view, you're helping someone, helping them with their lives. Whether it's burgled or whether a tree falls on it or whether your pet falls over or whatever it is, call one number, we become a positive influence on someone's life rather than you only call us when there's a problem, when there's, you know, and then you're not sure if you're properly covered. So there's a way of, 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 of doing that. One of the examples I like in terms of getting between incumbents as we are, insurers and a customer, is ClassPass. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, if you buy ClassPass, you can go to any gym class in a, any gym in London. What a great idea. Don't have to join any gym you've got has a timetable to be there for a certain time. How about just, well, I happen to be here in London, I want to go to a particular class, I just pick the nearest gym. ClassPass doesn't have any gyms. It's that classic intervention between the customer and the gyms. No gyms, it's just an online service and a card. They've done the deals. You can go to any class in any gym in London. Great. It's a great model. So we want to look at those kind of models. And then the fourth one is the way that the world is changing. So, and the way the shared economy is starting to evolve. So an example of that if from an insurance point of view might be you and your neighbors all insure together in a neighborhood household insurance system. You will contribute and you pay out any, any problems, any claims in your neighborhood. Obviously you're all in it together so you, there's a bit of social pressure not to make too many claims. And then any, any profit that's left at the end of the year, you distribute it back out. So you all have skin in the game and you benefit if you're good insureds. It's an example of a shared economy. Another example is uh, the way technology is changing is insuring driverless cars. So we'll be moving with the times. We'll be looking at new models, which you can, which you can adopt with a shared economy, and we'll be making sure that we move with what insurance people that they need. An example is Airbnb. Uh, most insurers won't cover that. Because of the philosophy we have is if we haven't 
explicitly excluded it, it's included. We haven't explicitly excluded Airbnb use. Your, our standard home cover covers you renting out your room through Airbnb and you're protected, your contents on your house is protected even if strangers who rent out your room to strangers through Airbnb is covered. So you have to keep moving with the times and understanding what people do and what cover they want. We'll continue to innovate on products on that fourth way. Uh, the, this, the key theme in the insurance industry has been one of consolidation. So all the brokers have been buying each other and getting larger. Uh, and so are the insurers starting to do now. You're, you'll have seen in the, in the news about acquisitions going on and, and we, we've been cited in the papers as, as a target for that. As insurers try to become global, what they're trying to do there is, is a protection, it's a form of protection to get larger and to consolidate. Uh, and to try to take uh, advantage of economies of scale. Uh, but you can only go so far with that. At some point, there's going to be a change of model. There's going to be the Uber for the taxi drivers. There's going to be an Uber for insurance that's going to happen. I want to be part of that. I think we can, but you have to engage and you have to try lots of things, kiss lots of frogs before we figure out which one will be the one that succeeds. I think that time has come for insurance and the way people view that, that they no longer accept it. I think we've paid out insurance for long enough uh, and not necessarily got the returns that people have expected. We do work hard to do that ourselves, but it's, uh, it, as I say, it's not an industry that people have much interest in or like that much, we see as a necessary evil. So I think customers' views are changing and, and they will no longer tolerate that. I think we need to move. I think we need to start to add more value and have more of a proper relationship like other suppliers of services would do. There's definitely a trade-off between sharing data and getting advantage in premium. Uh, it may be a disadvantage depending on your lifestyle or what you're doing. Uh, so I, I would like us, Google haven't done us any favours in this, you know, the, 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 the misuse, potential misuse of data and the signing the agreement in order to just be able to use their services that they can use their data in any way has not, us any, does, has not, done, has not done us any favours at all. Uh, I would prefer to have a more transparent relationship with our customers where we agree exactly what the data is for and then we protect it on your behalf so you know it's to your benefit but it's not going to be misused. That's really important and we're used to being trusted insurers so I think we can extend that to trusting you trusting us with your data. Uh, so yeah that, that it's yet to be seen how much information you need to share, how that affects premiums and how that settles down. But what I do like about it is the insurance industry up to now, we've had to work on an aggregated basis. Basically, you, we, we cover everyone by writing insurance for lots of people so of the same type. Uh, and then you protect individuals just through large numbers. As you bring it down to more individuals, that gets harder. You have to be more accurate with individual insurance. Uh, so I think we need some kind of blend of sharing personal information to get lower premiums if you act in the right way that gives lower risk and still providing some kind of cover through aggregation. I think you're always looking for the next thing uh, and sometimes you don't know what that is until you've done the last thing. So it's hard to answer the question, is this something I haven't achieved because my answer tomorrow might be different to today or next year. You have to recognise I have to start to recognise I'm 53 now, so mortality starts to kick in. So I start to think about I haven't got much time left. So when you're younger, you're going to live forever. So it's all about what am I going to do next, no problem, I could do anything. And then you succeed in something, and then you get to my sort of level, it's like, what, what can I do in the time that I've got left? And I think that will change. I still have the same ambition and drive as I did 20, 30 years ago. That hasn't changed. In fact, it's probably more because I've got the opportunity to do more in my position. So I'm actually more motivated now than I was when I was in my 20s because it's just so much more opportunity. And I get it more. 
I kind of get what life's about more. I get what I get more about how to be happy. And it, being happy for me, so it's this different answer for everybody, is about achieving and doing things in the right way. As in my article, I desperately want businesses to be run by people with good morals, people who make good decisions. That's the only thing that really works. And I think that's what the world's looking for. And we're trying to find ways to do that. And we haven't got there yet. So anything I can do to help that, to create an environment to... That's why I lecture to students, because I'm trying to get them early. I want to say, this is what it's about. This is what you need to look for. This is what I'd like you to be. So I present myself as, I'm one of the fat cats. I'm one of the 1%, you know, 1% versus 99. But I want it to be different too. So not all the 1% are all on the take. They're all big fat cats who don't care, who are keeping the other 99 down. There are lots of us who've been lucky enough to get to that position who want to redress the balance. And I'll do everything I can to make that happen in the right way. The easy answer to what I would do instead of working is go and be a mountain leader. But it's not true, actually. I, I like both. When I've, when I've climbed in the mountains and I've taken two or three months off to do the, the mountains I've done, I love it. I love the physical challenge and achievement. But I miss the intellectual challenge of work. And when I'm at work, I miss the physical challenge. You, so I want both. Uh, and you can't have both, really, the, the constraints. So when you say, what else would you do if you weren't working, I'd still want to work. Because I've got to a place where I'm passionate about what I do, I get paid for it, and I'm quite good at it. I've got that nice, that triangle that, that, that I think everyone else should look for. So I want to keep working. I want to keep doing it in the best way I can. And then when I get a chance, I'll do physical achievements and challenges as well. That's, that's a hard one to answer because I think successful people never see themselves as successful. They always want more. So those kind of people who do achieve things have the passion and drive that, why would you stop? You achieve something, and like, what's next, what's next, what's next? I think the only thing that stops successful people, as I said, is mortality, really, you run out of time. But, but the, those kind of people never, I don't believe, go, right, I'm done. You don't become, anyone who says, right, I'm gonna retire at 30, it means they're doing something they don't enjoy. It means they're in the wrong job. It means they hate their lives and they want something else. If you do what you're passionate about and what you enjoy, you never want it to stop. So, therefore, you're never as successful as you want to be. Visionary, there's the standard answer for visionary, which is Nelson Mandela. Uh, but not necessarily because of what he achieved, it's an obvious answer. But for me, the interesting thing about his life is the 27 years he spent in, in jail. I think that prepared him for doing what he did in the right way, in a human way, taking everyone with him. I think if he'd got the opportunity before the prison, he wouldn't have had the humility, the understanding, the compassion that he showed. I think that's what drew us all in. And those 27 years, were, all, I think, were the preparation for doing it right. You look at other people that have tried to do it, they've never had the same kind of magic, the same kind of connection to all of us that he managed to portray. How did he do that? So I think there's something unique about his time in prison that, that prepared him and made him different than men he could. I think geniuses come from the, the people who figure out the beauty of the way the world works. So Einstein's a good example because his algorithms, his, his equation were just so simple and described the whole world in some ways. How the hell did he do that? That takes genius to me. And I think there's more discoveries in the future. Our world seems to be governed by, by a sort of formulas and rules that make it all work together. And anyone who can discover that in physics or maths or any way, I think is a genius. The one I'm reading at the moment is Black Box Thinking. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's by Matthew Syed. Uh, and it's about how do you keep improving? So the black box is from airlines. So airlines have become fantastically safe because they've 
embraced and accepted failure. So the black box idea is, every time there's a, an accident, they grab the black box, they do the research, they figure out what they went wrong, what went wrong, and then they do something very different that very few other industries do. They publish it worldwide. And they say, we made a massive mistake in this area, and you can all learn from it. So the whole of the airline industry has massively improved its safety because they accept failure, they embrace it, and they learn from it. And we should all do that much more. The alternative he gives is the, is the medical profession, where any mistakes you make are, tend to not be looked at, or it was just unlucky, someone died. Uh, and for a long time they didn't make any improvements, and death rates stayed high, and they've only recently started to realise my God, we're making a massive mistake here. We should be looking at every failure that there is, learning from it, publicising it, talking about it. And they're starting to, to do that now. And death rates are falling as a result in certain areas. Same with our business. And the larger you get, the harder it is. It's easy to say. But I know, and, and it's a bit like that here, if you're a successful business, you want to carry on being successful. And all the leaders of that business are successful doing what they do. So why not carry on? And any failures, well, didn't quite get that right, we'll, we'll sort it out and we'll do some, try something else. But if you embrace failure, this is what startups do and entrepreneurs do, they try something, it fails. They don't go, oh, cover it up. They go, oh, why was that? What can we learn? Let's try it again. And that's what we're going to try and do with our Hiscox Futures, is start to embrace failure. But I've got to keep it separate from the rest of the organisation, because all of my colleagues are working hard on the successful machine. They want that to carry on and this is, this is scary, disruptive stuff. Um, and they need to be protected. So we're going to create a separate environment to allow people to fail, to learn from it, and then figure out how we can be successful. All success is based on loads of, loads of failures. We just don't talk about them. I don't know if you've heard of the book called The Tipping Point. Uh, so, that talks about uh, the, the gut reaction of, of a specialist. So the example that they use is uh, a Venus de Milo, I think, a statue. And this specialist guy who makes sure they're authentic looked at this statue and said, that's a fake. It's just gut reaction. He didn't know why. All the papers were in order. It was all authentic. And he just couldn't figure it out. And it took ages and ages. And eventually they figured out that it was, that it was a fraud. It was a fake. And it was just gut reaction. Our gut reactions are the sum of all of our experiences. And everything we've learned comes out often in an immediate emotional response. You just, that's wrong, that's right, whatever that is. That's the sum of all of your knowledge and understanding. And that's what we should rely on. And, and the older you get, the kind of better it gets. It's quite a lot of older people talk about gut instinct more and more. It's because they're relying on all of their, all of their experience of their lives. And that's, that's what I would always listen to. So there's no one piece of advice. For me, it's about understanding how you collect experience, collect knowledge, to get better and better at responding to situations and, and relying on your instincts. They are the sum of your total life in some ways. Mm -hmm.